Okay, this is a uh, course, uh, nuclear, well, it's actually a cross-listed course, nuclear engineering, physics, and electrical and computer engineering, 525. Um, it's called Introduction to Plasmas. Now, as a sort of comment, um, plasma physics has a number of applications, the most prominent being magnetic fusion, and also, uh, well, magnetic and inertial confinement fusion, and space physics, uh, plasma processing, and a number of things like that. Um, historically, the University of Wisconsin-Madison has had a very large involvement uh, in plasma physics research and the development of the science of plasma science for the last uh, approximately uh, 30 years, um, since started by Don Kirst in the early 60s. Uh, as such, uh, it's a very active program in the nuclear engineering department, in the physics department, and in the electrical and computer engineering department, and that is the reason why this is a, a cross-listed course uh, among the three departments. The course has as prerequisites, basically, that one has had um, some intermediate level mechanics and also... Um, such, uh, such as Physics uh, 311, and also that one has had some intermediate level electricity and magnetism, usually just abbreviated, of course, as E&M, like Physics uh, 322. The basic purpose of this course is as an introduction to plasmas, but perhaps we could be a bit more specific. Namely, uh, it's to sort of develop an understanding of what we mean by plasmas, so an understanding of plasmas, and also the uh, models used to describe it, used to describe um, a plasma. But many of the much of the emphasis in plasma physics is actually not on the science development itself, but is also on the applications. So we will, in addition, want to explore some applications, the most prominent of which, particularly here at UW-Madison, is in the area of plasma confinement and heating, uh, primarily by magnetic uh, confinement of plasmas. So that's sort of uh, what we're up to. Now, the uh, texts that we use for this course, um, I, we, I have prescribed for it two texts. One is the book by Chen, and uh, that's, uh, I presume, all of you have gotten. It's a, a book called uh, Introduction, uh, Introduction to um, Plasma Physics and Controlled Fusion, and it's listed as Volume 1, Plasma Physics. There, this is actually the second edition, uh, published in 1983. The first one was published in the early 70s. The first edition, if you see some in the library, will also cover magnetic fusion or con plasma confinement, um, magnetic fusion, and so forth. Um, however, this one he chose to write, uh, Frank Chen, that is, he chose to abbreviate uh, or I'm sorry, to expand the basic plasma physics, which was in the original text, and he's planning on planning on a, uh, writing a second text, volume two, on the introduction to magnetic confinement fusion, inertial confinement fusion. However, as of now, uh, that second volume is not yet available, is not finished, basically. So uh, this is uh, the, also, I should say, well, anyway, so this is the basic text. I should also say that this is the, uh, for the field, turns out to be sort of the standard uh, text um, for plasma physics. It's the standard, I should so, say, introductory text, introductory text for plasma physics that's used uh, throughout the United States and actually throughout the world, typically. Um, by the way, perhaps I should write that that is published uh, by Plenum Press, uh, New York, 1983, for the second edition. Now, this text is, however, 
uh, a kind of text that's, let me call it, intuitive. Um, it's, uh, I should explain first perhaps that uh, uh, while I certainly work a lot with plasma experimentalists, I am uh, by training or, or emphasis uh, a plasma theorist. And what one finds is that this text by Chen is more sort of phenomenological and often does the mathematics in ways that's kind of okay for a simple uh, phenomenology or intuitive feel, but is not the way that one would approach the subject if one was going on uh, in the subject further. So what I've uh, prescribed as a secondary text, so Chen is the kind of primary text, so let's put a little star by that perhaps, uh, is, a book, is a book by Bittencourt, uh, and it's, let's just say, more mathematically inclined. Uh, some would say perhaps too mathematically inclined, but I think personally um, uh, it provides a good balance with uh, the Chen textbook. And that is published by Pergamon Press uh, from Oxford or New York, uh, published in 1986. And what we will basically do uh, is we will use the, the text Chen as our primary logic structure. We will go through sort of chapter by chapter Chen. However, uh, I will always be suggesting um, uh, reading material, complementary reading material from Bittencourt. And the idea is that that complementary reading material is more mathematically inclined, more mathematically rigorous. Uh, I might say when I was growing up in the field of plasma physics some 20 years ago or so, um, the, closer to 30, 30 years ago, anyway, 25 years ago, one had a, a feeling that one had all mathematics in plasma physics. And in that sense, Chen's textbook is a very nice introductory textbook in that it's much more physically inclined and much less detailed mathematics uh, um, type uh, approach to things. But on the other hand, the field of plasma physics is fairly intensive in its mathematical uh, parts. And so uh, I feel by, by having the, the complement of these two texts, the more sort of um, phenomenological, intuitive, experimental oriented one, Chen, and the more mathematical oriented one, Bittencourt, that we get a, a good balance between the two subjects. Um, now, we'll basically, we will actually uh, cover um, both texts uh, and read them from, end up from cover to cover. Um, and our approximate pace will be sort of approximately two thirds uh, of a chapter of Chen per week. Um, actually, it works out to more like two chapters of uh, Bittencourt per week. I might say the other thing you might find a, a virtue, so to speak, in the Chen textbook, the second edition, is that uh, we will use MKS units throughout. Um, I might say uh, in plasma physics, uh, it has since much of it started as a mathematical physics subject and electricity and magnetism and heavy in it and mechanics. Um, much of the original theoretical work on plasma phys physics is written, the, the original uh, papers are all written in, C or not all, but almost all written in CGS units. And so when the first textbook, Chen, was written, uh, pragmatically, uh, he decided that to introduce people to the field appropriately, it would be best to introduce them to CGS units. But of course, as time has gone on, that textbook was published in, I think, 72, the first edition of Chen. Um, as time has gone on, uh, more and more engineering and physics curricula are introducing people to physics in MKS units. So when it came time to publish the second edition, uh, Chen wrote it then in MKS units, and also Bittencourt is in MKS units. Uh, I should, however, warn you that unfortunately, if you start delving into the into the raw literature, uh, scientific literature of plasma physics, and many other textbooks, which I will give you a listing of next time, uh, you will find an awful lot of CGS units. But uh, we will deal 
uh, essentially all in CGS, uh, I'm sorry, in MKS units, with only the caveat or comment, let me put it that way, that in fact um, uh, we have a tendency to to use the unit's number of cu particles per cubic centimeter as opposed to per cubic meter, and then you just have to multiply by 10 to the 6 to get them per cubic meter. But um, that's just uh, part of life, let me put it that way. Okay, so let me then indicate kind of the, the subjects that we're going to go into. Um, so, and basically this amounts to just an outline of both the course and pragmatically an outline of what, um, well, of the chapters of, of Chen, plus we will go on to uh, a couple of lectures at the end on and discussion of uh, controlled thermonuclear fusion, introduction to fusion. So this is really an outline uh, of the chapters of Chen, uh, but that's also the outline of the course. So first, in chapter one, uh, which we're going to cover in part today, um, it's basically an introduction uh, to plasmas, uh, sort of what is a plasma. And uh, what, uh, uh, what is the plasma state, let's call it that for this moment. Uh, what is the plasma state? Um, why do we study plasma physics? Uh, what are the sort of applications you get in mind? Uh, all that sort of thing. Then um, it turns out that a lot of what we're concerned about is we're going to have charged particles moving around in a medium. And uh, that's going to be the, the plasma medium. So the next thing we will go into is, uh, what, is what is called in the field uh, single particle orbits. And what is meant by that is that we have these charged particles that are going to be, you know, moving around, let's say, in a medium. And they are going to interact via electromagnetic forces, in particular by, via the Lorentz force. And so we need to understand uh, how these particles, charged particles, are going to move around, so-called their single particle orbits, or sometimes we call them uh, trajectories. And we need to understand how the single particles all by themselves would move around in, in uh, interaction with each other. Um, and these will be in both uniform electric fields and non-uniform electromagnetic fields, E and B. And in particular, in magnetic confinement systems, we're interested in inhomogeneous magnetic fields either of a toroidal or magnetic mirror, open geometry it's called, we'll come back to. So we're interested in how these particles, turns out, gyrate around field lines, move along field lines, and drift off of field lines. Um, okay, now the next uh, thing we'll go into, so that's sort of what is a plasma, what do the particle orbits do. The next thing after that will be, um, let's call them plasmas as fluids. Um, in truth, if we've got all these charged particles moving around, you know, maybe we should be talking about a single particle description. You know, we just add up all the particles. But there's going to be on the order of 10 to the 19th or 20th particles, so that's sort of not feasible. So what we will have to do is develop some form of a fluid framework for describing uh, plasmas, density conservation equation, momentum conservation equation, energy conservation equation, uh, things like that. And so we'll get uh, fluid equations, we'll get fluid flows, um, we'll get motions because we'll have magnetic fields often embedded in plasmas. We'll actually find out that plasmas can move along magnetic field lines sort of freely, but perpendicular to field lines not so freely, uh, only by drifts and things like that. Um, and, and basically we'll also get into in this subject what's called the plasma approximation meaning when can we use some sort of uh, fluid description? When is it appropriate to use some form of a fluid description? Now, it turns out that uh, when you pluck a plasma or otherwise disturb it, uh, it doesn't just sit there in equilibrium. It's, uh, it's sort of like it has wave responses, like I'm talking to you and there are sound waves propagating out through the room that you hear me with or via but in a plasma, you pluck it, and it's an electrically almost neutral medium, uh, quasi-neutral, we'll call it. 
And as I pluck it, there will be various types of electromagnetic waves, electrostatic and electromagnetic, that move in the plasma. So what we will be interested then in this part will be waves in plasmas. And for, for that, we'll first have to a little bit review what about waves in general, some general properties. And then we'll talk about uh, electromagnetic waves, uh, electrostatic waves in the plasma. And a little bit, the, again, the continuing complexity will be the fact that we uh, will have a embedded magnetic field, equilibrium magnetic field in the plasma. And as such, that will cause a very large anisotropy in the types of waves that can propagate along magnetic field lines where the plasma is relatively free to move versus those which can go perpendicular. And so we'll have perpendicular dielect well, various waves moving parallel and perpendicular, and we'll do it with and without magnetic fields. And then there'll be some experimental stuff and, and so forth. Now, uh, then we'll go on from there, that is to say from waves, to talk a little bit about um, what's uh, kind of a, a, a bit of a misnomer chapter, but anyway, uh, diffusion and resistivity. And there, fundamentally, the idea is that we many times in plasma physics we speak of collision-less plasmas, meaning it's all very weak collisions. Mostly there are just collective interactions between particles. And as such, uh, we ignore collisional effects entirely. But in fact, um, these uh, diffusion and resistivity because, come about because of collisional effects in a plasma. And what we'll be interested in are how a plasma moves across magnetic fields. Uh, also, if you apply an electric field to a plasma, uh, what, it's, what is its electrical resistivity? Um, how does it diffuse across field lines? Uh, if you put in some plasma, how fast does it just kind of decay out because of collisional effects? And uh, generally. Now, we will then, as I uh, mentioned on, the more, uh, on some details of the course, we'll have a, um, a, a midterm exam, and that will actually uh, happen at this point. Uh, this will also be what is, of course, in Wisconsin, euphemistically referred to as the spring vacation, uh, usually arrives with a good snowstorm and uh, nice cold weather, but uh, anyway. Um, so then after we come back from spring vacation, then we'll uh, be going on to Chapter 6, where basically the subject is uh, equilibrium and stability. And what we mean by equilibrium is, again, is basically a force balance equilibrium. And what we mean by stability is if I am in equilibrium and then I make a perturbation, uh, will I go away from that? Uh, the analogy is I can put a ball on top of a hill and it can be in equilibrium if I just carefully balance it right on top of the hill. But if I kick it just a little bit, it'll fall down. That would be an unstable motion, we would say. It turns out plasmas can collectively get together and do things and call collective instabilities. And so we'll need to talk about how they are in equilibrium first as a fluid in equilibrium with the magnetic field structure, and then how they go uh, uh, well, uh, how they become unstable uh, in analogy with fluid instability, so-called Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, and then some additional two-stream instabilities and things like that. Then we go on from there. Chapter seven will be an introduction uh, to uh, kinetics or kinetic theory. Um, there, uh, we get into the question of uh, how do you really derive, um, you know, a kinetic theory is in some sense much more rigorous than a fluid theory. And the question is, well, what, uh, what kind of approximations do we need to do uh, to go from a distribution function of velocity to a fluid uh, description of a plasma? What are the uh, limitations on that? Um, also, we get into things, something called Landau damping. Uh, since I said the plasma is more or less collisionless, uh, you know, collision bowl effects are quite small. Uh, because of that, there's an element of, gee, uh, if, I, uh, is, if it's collisionless, how does it actually get some damping? And it turns out there's a collisionless damping mechanism that comes about because the waves 
are, let us say, moving at one speed, having a certain phase velocity, and if there are resonant particles moving at the same phase velocity, then they can interact with the wave, and under certain conditions, that will turn out to cause you cause a damping uh, mechanism. Um, anyway, and we'll have various other um, uh, things in, in regard to uh, introduction to kinetic theory. Then we'll be going on to chapter 8, which is um, nonlinear effects. And uh, here's what we're interested in are things like sheaths at the edge of a plasma, um, where you get nonlinear effects, you might say. But more particularly, shock waves, uh, nonlinear turbulence type theories, uh, so called ponder motive forces, things like parametric instabilities, which are nonlinear couplings of waves. And then, like I say, in the old Chen, there was an introduction to fusion. It was actually even chapter 9, but <laughs> he doesn't have that, and we have, kind of around here at least, a, a sort of interest in that. So what we will do is we'll have an introduction to fusion. Uh, and here what we have in mind are primarily, since uh, that's the uh, local flavor, is uh, magnetic confinement uh, and heating of plasmas. And we'll... Um, spend a little time on that. Uh, and uh, basically, I sometimes call it plasma confinement and heating, and we'll try at that point to indicate uh, if, you know, what the sequential courses after this introduction to plasmas uh, are that are offered, some cross-listed, some not so cross-listed uh, around. And finally, uh, one of the things about a course like this, uh, um, People always have a little trouble, you know, visualizing a plasma. And, and also, since we have, happen to have a lot of very active and very good experiments here locally, um, what we uh, will do is, uh, on about the last day of class, uh, we'll, uh, we'll visit um, some plasma labs uh, here on campus. So this is kind of an outline then, uh, and in some sense we'll spend... Um, a little, well, a sort of week and a half to two weeks on each of these subjects, although uh, the chapter one, the introduction, we won't spend quite so long on. We'll basically be on that only this week. But from there on, we'll, we'll be more like sort of two weeks per chapter, one and a half to two weeks per chapter. Um, and it's, you know, 15 weeks in the semester, so that works out about right, basically. Okay, so uh, enough of the kind of little bit of uh, what are we up to or something like that. Um, probably what we next ought to talk about is uh, what is a plasma. And for that, um, we need to first uh, make a little bit of a sort of definition of energy or something like this. Um, now, for a moment, I won't worry about definitions of energy versus temperature, uh, you know, three halves kT type things. But really what I want to do is, is uh, consider the units of this. Now, usually when you talk about temperature, um, what, what people have in mind is, uh, let's say, degrees Kelvin, if we're dealing with MKS, or MKS units. On the other hand, when we deal with energy, we have in mind uh, EV, electron volts, at least, or, or well, I should say, actually, we have in mind uh, joule, joules in MKS units, ergs in CGS units. But pragmatically, um, we uh, in plasma physics will find it convenient to talk about electron volts instead of uh, joules, it turns out, with the conversion being, of course, that there's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th um, EV uh, per joule. Now, when you talk about single particle basis, it turns out the EVs are kind of a unit, convenient unit. Now, but what we will want to talk about is plasma temperatures, and we find it inconvenient, actually, to talk in terms of degrees Kelvin. Um, let me jump ahead just to comment. We're going to have to ionize these plasmas, so we're going to have to pull electrons off of atoms, and that ionization potential is 13 point. 6 eV electron volts, right, to pull one electron off of a hydrogen ion to atom to um, get two, uh, hydrogen, a proton and an electron. 
So we're going to find it often convenient to talk in EV. And then the question becomes, what is the conversion factor? Well, it turns out 11,400 degrees Kelvin is approximately equal to 1 EV. So we will then some, mostly end up using electron volts as our unit of, of temperature. But now the next thing I want to indicate is let's talk about something which we might call states of matter. So let's start out with water, or actually ice, and um, we're going to want a, a, a scale of temperature, and it's going to be more or less logarithmically logarithmic, but there's no zero on a logarithm, so don't, don't cause me too much problem, but I'm going to have a zero on here. So we're going to have a, a temperature of zero on a logarithmic scale, being slightly unusual. And on the upper scale, I will list things in degrees Kelvin, and on the bottom scale, or below the line, I will list them in EV. So we'll start out at, at zero, and you know we're going to have more or less logarithmic here. Now, at, uh, as we are at very low temperatures, uh, if we imagine we had water and at very low temperatures, namely below uh, 273 degrees uh, Kelvin, we would have ice would be the state in which we would find um, the water. Okay? And how much is 273 degrees Kelvin? Well, it's of course about 0.025 EVs. Now, what happens when I heat that up? Well, <clears throat> basically ice has binding energies having to do with long scale structures. And those long scale structures obviously have energies which are binding energies which are lower than 0.025 EV. So when I heat up the ice, I break it. This is going to be a funny scale, but anyway. Uh, here's 373 degrees Kelvin, or about 0.035 EV. And in this region, I get water. So I heat it up, and I get water. And in water, what I have done is I've broken one set of crystal lattice, if you will, or not quite crystal lattice, but a sort of solid binding energies, 0.025, and I've moved up to, in some sense, only long-scale fluid, um, um, long-scale structures, uh, water, basically. And what happens when I hit 373 degrees Kelvin or 100 degrees C? Well, I start boiling, right? So I get steam. Now, what does steam mean? Well, steam means that I've broken these long-scale binding energies having to do with um, fluid-like structures, okay, like in a fluid, and now I've got more or less water molecules bubbling around. So uh, we've got H2O molecules, which, however, are still together, so to speak. Now, what happens as I heat those? Well, you know, H2O, the H2 are bound together with the oxygen, right? And someplace around, it's, I don't know precisely, and it doesn't make too much difference, sometime around 1 EV, I'm getting a little out of control here, um, and you notice I'm beginning to swing over to the lower axis because things are getting a little... Uh, bigger numbers, you know, up here on the degrees Kelvin. Uh, somehow we're around 1 EV, which is then, you know, 11,000, 10,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, what I do is I break up the, the, the molecular bonds and get into uh, only um, atoms. So I have H0, comma, uh, oxygen 0, uh, maybe 2 H0, oxygen 0. Uh, atoms, but those are, are separate. Okay. Now, what happens if I keep heating? You know, I'm, I don't ask how I'm heating. We'll have to worry about that a little bit later. But uh, anyway, uh, as when I pass, let's say 13.6 eV, okay, that's the uh, the energy required to strip off from hydrogen. Uh, the 
the electron, which is encircling the atom, uh, or the nucleus, the proton. And so above that, I end up having H plus plus an electron. So they're no longer... What, what I'm doing, of course, here is every time I go up in energy, I'm breaking a bond, okay, some form of a bond. And, by the way, we're now up to, let's now start labeling it here, I'm up to 10 to the 4th, about 10 to the 5th degrees Kelvin, okay. Now, when I have broken apart this bond and created a bunch of hydrogen or protons, okay, just kind of moving around, and electrons all moving around together, then under typical conditions, having a bunch of these, it turns out, this is where we will be into a plasma. So there will be additional conditions uh, for which this is true, uh, <clears throat> or criteria for when we'll really have a plasma, but, uh, but this is the range in which we start getting into a plasma. And in truth, a plasma will extend down into the EV range and up to rather high energies, it turns out. Now, so I keep breaking bonds. What's the next bond I can break? Okay. Yeah, nuclear bonds. So, for instance, suppose I had, I, I worried about I had oxygen uh, plus and electrons. By the way, oxygen actually has uh, eight electrons around it, right? But what's the binding energy of eight electrons to get that last electron off? Well, it turns out it's on the order of a kilovolt, or ten to the um, uh, seventh degree, ten to the sixth degrees, Kel ten to the seven degrees Kelvin. So that's we're going to require a fairly hot plasma to totally strip um, a an oxygen. But indeed. If we get up here, and what is the sort of typical binding energy for nucleons here in, say, an oxygen nucleus? About how, how strongly are they bound? <coughs> sort of MeV, 5 MeV, something like that. Okay. So let's say MeV. And we're now talking then, uh, that's 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 4th is about 10 to the 10th degrees Kelvin. Um, now what... Uh, what happens if I go beyond that? Well, nuclei are made out of gluons, right? So you can get on up in here to, you know, GeV or uh, type energies, and you can have uh, breaking apart of nuclear matter and so forth. So people sometimes speak about, when you get up into here, people will sometimes speak about a nuclear plasma, and the plasma will be now not strictly in the sense of uh, collect of um, electrical neutrality, but it turns out the more general sense of a plasma is to worry about so-called collective effects, and we'll show you what we mean by that in a moment. And I've run out of space, but uh, some people even talk about a quark gluon plasma, okay? And uh, they talk about very heavy nuclei as being composed of quark gluon plasmas at you know, GeV and so forth, energies. But for what we're going to talk about in this course, uh, mainly what we're going to be interested in is things that range from about one electron volt, where you get some partially ionized gas, up to uh, on the order of, um, oh, things like, say, 100 kiloelectron volts. And in that regard, we might... Um, think about, uh, uh, well, uh, yeah. Okay, now a couple other little diddlies to put in here. Um, what about the sun? By the way, the sun's a real good example of a plasma. Gravitationally confined, it turns out. Anybody know what the temperature on the, on the sun is? Well, it turns out it's about five or six kilovolts, okay? And so it turns out it's about, uh, uh, so let's just put in here the sun. It's about uh, 6 kiloelectron volts, and it's about uh, 60, therefore 60 times 10 to the 6th uh, degrees Kelvin, as I recall. I'd have to 10, zoom, 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 zoom. yeah. Anyway, so, uh, uh, and that's a, that's a good uh, plasma, it turns out. 
Okay, but next we need to go on and say a little bit um, what we um, really mean by uh, a plasma. And, um, well, and I'll, I'll come back to some applications um, in a moment, I guess. I'll do this in a little bit different order than I was thinking about. Um, okay, so uh, the next thing I want to uh, then go into is what is a plasma, really? So a definition of a plasma is, in fact, um, that a plasma is a quasi-neutral, and we'll have to talk about these words here in a minute, a quasi-neutral gas of charged, sort of, and neutral. We would like to have it all charged particles many times, but or mostly, but sometimes it'll have also some neutral particles in it. Um, charged particles in which um, the particle interactions, how they interact, are predominantly collective. So again, this is going to require a fair bit of, um, <laughs> of definition or of, of clarification of what we mean by these various things. So. Um, one advantage of doing this is I can, um, with these pieces of paper, is I can do this a little bit. Anyway, okay, what do we need? First, let's kind of take a look at these things. Uh, what do we mean by a quasi-neutral gas? Well, remember a little bit ago what we said was what we were interested in was heating things up to the place where we got H pluses, and electron minuses. So we obviously have some positive charges and some negative charges. But we, you know, if you started out just heating a medium and you had an awful lot of electrons and an awful lot of ions, or an awful lot of neutral hydrogen, and you kept heating it, you would get an equal number of protons and electrons. What would happen if you lost a few of one or the other? Well, it turns out you'd build up an awfully big charge and an awfully big electric field very quickly. Okay, So what we have to have, um, and, and we'll be more uh, specific about this in a moment, um, we have to have approximately uh, equal numbers of plus and minus charge, charged particles. Um, on a scale, um, let's call it long compared to the collective interaction scale, scale length. I might say, as a sort of philosophical thing, which I'll come back to a number of times, uh, in many areas of physics, engineering, science, um, you often uh, don't talk about, let me call it the, fun oops, sorry, fun the fundamental underlying, um, say, assumptions that you're making about scale lengths and times. So, you know, if you're interested in uh, some sort of electrical um, circuitry, you know, it has a certain ringing circuit uh, frequency or something. But in, in worrying about that, you don't worry about the details of atomic physics that go into it. You have a more fluid-like description or macroscopic description. In plasma physics, we end up having to deal with a large number of time scales and a large number of, um, of length scales. And the net result of that is we're often a little bit more talking about 
well, we're going to kind of be much longer scale length than this and much shorter scale length than that and so forth and so on. And this will occasionally give you the feeling that, my gosh, we're making an awful lot of approximations and how can we possibly be right? But you should think of it more in the spirit of we're trying to be more honest about, you know, that we are making these various approximations and we're just keeping track of them a little bit uh, as, as we go along. Okay, so what... So this quasi-neutral gas says on some scale length, which is going to turn out to be the Debye length, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, we need to have a roughly equal number of electrons and ions all packed in here together. And this will have to, uh, we'll have to have, well, we'll just end up having to uh, state that mathematically but I, later, but I guess I won't say that. So this is the meaning of the word uh, of the quasi-neutral gas. Um, now, the gas can be composed not solely of charged particles, okay? Um, if I go back to this, I, I needed to um, go back to this rather horrible diagram now. <laughs> uh, if I'm down here at this point on the scale, we know that there are, no ion, there are no free ions to speak of in a solid, okay? And there's very few in a liquid and really even very few in steam. There are no free ions in that. On the other hand, by the time I get up to really up into here, you know, a kilovolt electron temperature, 10 to the uh, seventh uh, degrees Kelvin, something like that, I've got the uh, electrons and ions pulled apart. So plasmas actually extend over the whole range where I might have um, fully ionized plasmas, where, where all of the particles are charged particles, into partially ionized plasmas, where I have a mixture of down around a few EV, you know, I got some charged particles and some neutrals and so forth. So when we're defining all this, we make this explicit uh, by saying that uh, in the definition of a plasma that it is a quasi-neutral gas of charged and neutral. Most of the time when we're talking in this course, we will um, not be so interested in the neutral particles. We, they're sort of a nuisance. We would rather wasn't there. And so I'll put a, a sort of light cancellation through that. Uh, it's one of those uh, facts of life you'd rather not have, but many times you have to take account of it. Okay. Sure. What are the neutral particles? Oh, if we go back to this example here, good question, what are the neutral particles? If we go back to this example, uh, suppose I had a plasma at 10 EV. Well, that's not quite enough to ionize in, in a 10 EV plasma. I would have a Maxwellian distribution function of electrons. So I'd have some electrons above 13.6 ionizing, you know, the, the hydrogen uh, by collisional interactions. And I'd have uh, some, a goodly number that were below the ionization potential of 13.6 EV. So the net result is I'd have uh, some, uh, just imagining I'd cleaned out the oxygen somehow or other, I'd have the hydrogen but I'd have a mixture of that hydrogen atoms, but I'd have a mixture of that with the uh, ionized protons and electrons then. Those free electrons came, came from, from that, that hydrogen, hydrogen. yeah. Okay. Although I was trying to indicate that if I had ionized the oxygen, okay, I'd get eight electrons of, and, and a seven, an eight times charged oxygen. Or the problem we have is that maybe the oxygen is only ionized three or four times. Uh, and then you get into mixed situations like that. But usually the mixture is that uh, you hope, if you, had a, if you make a laboratory plasma, let me say it that way, you kind of hope that you start out with uh, hydrogen and, um, uh, I'm sorry, a pure hydrogen, and uh, you break it apart into protons and electrons. Now you get down to the real lab and you make it and you find out, well, you got a little pump oil around, okay? We're going to be in vacuum conditions quite often. And then in pump oil, you'll find various hydrocarbons, silicons, and things like that. So they're going to have oxygen, nitrogen, and a little bit of air leaks in, nitrogen, oxygen. But those are usually percent-type constituents. So we tend to think of hydrogen-type neutrals and protons and electrons. But there are some plasmas for which this is not at all the case. And uh, that's a, a, a bit of life, let's just put it that way. Okay, so the next thing we need to describe on our definition here, a quasi-neutral gas, 
we'd like it mostly charged. There may be a few neutrals of what we hadn't quite ionized or only partially ionized particles. And then in which the per particle interactions are predominantly collective. So I need to uh, talk about that. Um, so here we want, uh, let's say, it, uh, collective uh, interactions. Now here, what we have in mind uh, is that um, these charged particles are going to be moving through a medium. Um, and they're going to interact not as two-body interactions, but uh, they'll interact simultaneously with, uh, uh, well, sorry, I should start out the other way, charged particles. interact um, simultaneously with many other charged particles, and I'll sketch this in a moment on the next transparency. Um, and in particular, what we mean by that is not solely or not just two-body interactions. So I'll have to uh, uh, kind of try to, to sketch that. So let's imagine for a moment that what we were trying to do was we were trying to say, what's, what do the neutral particles in this room do? Okay. Well, if I follow neutral particles in, around in... Uh, uh, in a in a regular gas, and just just call it in a gas here for a moment. Then you know I'd have a whole bunch of particles. I'll just you know sketch a whole bunch of them here. And what happens? Well, I have. Um, I guess I better make him a different color particle. So I'll start over here. I'm a particle. And I move along. And uh, as I go past these two particles, do I see any interaction? Do I get deviated in my path? Well, presuming, okay, that, that these particles, how big is a particle first? Well, it's as big as the Bohr radius, basically, okay, about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. And assuming that I'm a further distance than that apart from the other particle, uh, by the way, what's the density of particles in this room, by the way? Well, it might be a density here. Here I go in centimeters. Sorry about that. But anyway, it might be a density of about 10 to the 20th uh, per cubic centimeter. And so a typical spacing of neutrals would be 1 over n to the 1 third. And so let's make it 21. I can do that. Uh, so this would be on the order of 10 to the minus 7th uh, centimeters. Okay. Actually, I'm sorry. It's really more like 19. So let's do let's do it as 18 and then it'll be 10 to the minus 6 centimeters. And that would be much greater than the Bohr radius, mainly 100 times factor, greater than the Bohr radius, which is of order 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So a neutral particle moving along, just going to go along, say, ha ha, you know, I don't even see these guys. I go on a straight line, and then bang, I hit another particle. Okay? I come within the Bohr radius of another particle, and, by the way, this will give us a cross-section of 10 to the minus 16 centimeters squared because, you know, a particle has a kind of spot size of about 10 to the minus 8 by 10 to the minus 8. And then I'll deviate, okay, and then I'll go in another straight line, and then I'll go in another straight line, okay, so forth. So neutral particles in a gas are characterized by straight line orbits, okay, between collisions. Let's now look at, suppose, on the other hand, we had charged particles, okay? So let's call it uh, charged particles, charged particle gas, let's call it. Now, the first problem I got is that um, uh, now i got two types of particles. Previously, I just had neutral particles, so, you know, I have a bunch of pluses here, okay? Plus, 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 plus. And now I better draw in an equal number of minuses. And I'll never get an equal number. But let's pretend it's an equal number. And now 
Uh, let's propose I have one of these two types of particles. I'll take the electrons here, which are the minuses, and I have him go along, okay? And he's coming in. Well, you know, here's going to be a particle here, and each charged particle has a Coulomb potential around it, right? So that potential is going to go like that charge, uh, let's call it Q, divided by R squared, some distance away. Okay, I'm sorry, R. The radial electric field is 1 over R squared, the E, the phi. Electric field is uh, of order uh, minus Q, uh, well, the force. Well, okay, it's, it's the Q of the charge over R squared. So anyway, it's going to get attracted. This electron, okay, is going to get attracted by that plus charge. Okay, so he's going to get twisted out of the way. Okay, then he's going to go past another one. He's going to get twisted out of the way. But wait a minute. This guy over here, electron, you know, 1 over R squared or a potential of 1 over R doesn't fall off all that. You know, it's got a long-range potential, right? So if I plot phi as a function of distance R, you know, it just keeps on going out there. So in fact, this poor electron is, is influenced not just by this nearby positive charge, okay, but also by that electron, by that plus, by that one, by that one. So this is what we mean, that this poor electron in trying to move through this medium is not a two-body interaction of it with only one particle at a time. If it gets very close, it may be mostly a two-body interaction. But mostly what's happening is it's a collective interaction of any one charged particle um, with many others simultaneously. And so the basic question is going to be, how are we going to describe that? Certainly not going to be single particle collisions. It's going to have to be some other uh, form of interaction. And uh, the basic idea then is how do we describe that and uh, is there, there will turn out to be, however, some maximum limit for this process called the by shielding. And so what uh, we'll break here and the comment will be that uh, we'll talk about this collective interaction a little bit after that. Okay.